Good evening and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dan Malthrop. I'm the Chief Executive here. I'm also a proud member and it is my privilege to welcome you to our event tonight celebrating the lessons and legacies of Gay Games 9. Being located downtown during GG9, all of us here at the City Club witnessed firsthand a, a significant transformation of our city. We were honored to partner with the Cleveland Foundation to host a conversation with Olympic diver and GG9 ambassador Greg Luganis. And it was the first time the pride flag graced the stage here at the City Club. That event also marked the first time that any of us can remember where a member of the audience who self-identified as transgendered asked a question. In some ways, it almost foreshadowed a now sold out panel we're having next week on transgender identity here in Northeast Ohio. Um, I know many of you wish you could get into that. I'm sorry, it's sold out. I mean, like it really is, like oversold out, and I blame Sue Dorfer. Um, none of this could have happened without GG9, and that is one of GG9's legacies and one of the, the great gifts of GG9, I think. Before you learn more about other lessons and legacies from GG9, we're going to hear from two important community leaders without whom GG9 might not have happened in Cleveland. Ron Richard, President and CEO of the Cleveland Foundation, and John Paturis, President and CEO of the Akron Community Foundation. Ron? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's, uh, you brave the cold, it's cold out there, but it's very warm in here with all these loving people. So it's great to reunite with you at the City Club that, um, so we can celebrate the legacy and learn from last year's Gay Games 9. Uh, as I stand before you, I'm reminded of addressing the crowd just six months ago, when it was much warmer, at the Gay Games closing ceremony. Uh, it really was amazing to be on stage looking out at this massive crowd of people. Um, it was really one of the proudest moments that I've had you know, in my 12 years as, as CEO of the Cleveland Foundation, and, and more importantly, probably one of the proudest moments of my life. So it was great. And really made me be, feel proud to be a Clevelander. What an inspirational landmark event for Cleveland and our region that was. We really did go all out but we should have, and we did. <laughs> Cleveland Foundation was honored to be the first presenting sponsor in Gay Games history, building on really a century of standing up for what's right on a whole host of issues. Uh, of course, the games featured impressive and entertaining sports and cultural events. <laughs> but more importantly, people all over the world got to know what Cleveland and Akron uh, are like, that we're progressive and inclusive cities. The games instilled a growing sense of enthusiasm and forward progress in our community, I think, across the board. That spirit remains with us today. I think you can feel it in this room. Uh, you can feel it in Cleveland and Akron, and I look forward to working with all of you to extend the momentum. Uh, I recently read an op-ed piece in the New York Times uh, I'm sure a lot of you read it uh, by columnist Frank Bruni, a, a gay man, uh, that uh, he chronicled the progress made for LGBT rights, but also the unfinished work ahead of us. And I, I don't know if you saw the piece, but it was um, it really touched my heart. He um, talk ab he talked about how in New York City, you know, which we all think as one of the most liberal cities. In the world, he still feels tense when his partner reaches out and holds his hand in public. And um, I just want to say that uh, what we're working for is, is the day where uh, people everywhere, New York, Cleveland, you name it, can hold their partners or husbands or wives' uh, hands uh, you know, in public without any fear uh, so that they can, as Mr. Bruni called it, you know, engage in an expression of tenderness and basic humanity. Uh, today, let's work hand in hand to make that a reality. Gay Games 9 was just the beginning. That's how I view it, just the beginning. Together, we want to ensure that this region remains diverse and inclusive, and, uh, and we want to lead the way by advocating for changes uh, in state laws that result in equality for all of our citizens, and the foundation will certainly do everything we can in that regard. And now, um, it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to my friend, John Paturas, CEO of the Akron Community Foundation, 
I'm especially proud that our two community foundations partnered to support Gay Games 9, and we will, I'm sure, continue to work together in this and other fields in the future. Right, John? A quick observation, the Cleveland Foundation's quarter of a million dollar uh, contribution. I saw Ron had two pages of notes. Uh, our gay community endowment fund with 100 grand, I have about a half of a page of uh, notes. So it, it seems fitting. Um, I don't think that it is a coincidence that the most successful uh, gay games in history happen to be in this community. Uh, where we celebrated this past year a very proud history and beginnings and legacy of the Cleveland Foundation as they celebrated 100 years in the community. Ron, congratulations. As we are equally proud uh, that in Akron, our Gay Community Endowment Fund proudly was one of the very first uh, charitable funds of its kind, not just in the state of Ohio, but anywhere in the United States of America. So, congratulations. We very much, uh, we very much enjoyed welcoming the athletes for the gay games and the participants and the spectators. Uh, I will tell you that my wife and I had a very memorable uh, time as the opening ceremonies were celebrated uh, down at the queue. Uh, I will most vividly remember the color, uh, the pageantry, uh, the costumes, uh, for some the lack of costumes. Uh, I mean nothing being worn, not just what they were wearing. Um, I also will never forget the cheers and the emotion from the crowd uh, when the uh, Russian parade of athletes came into the room that evening as well. Um, if you'll allow me, by the way, to recognize one of our very own who's sitting with me, uh, John Garofalo, who is our uh, vice president of our community investment and our grant making area, uh, proudly served as the, uh, one of the co-chairs of the opening ceremonies, which were just wonderful. And John, from all of us to you and your team, congratulations. <laughs> And finally, we very much look forward to embracing the same spirit and inspiration, excitement, and inclusiveness that was celebrated in the Gay Games and all of the important work that all of our organizations and your companies and organizations do in uh, Greater Akron, in Greater Cleveland, and throughout Northeastern Ohio. Thanks, everybody, very much. John told me he wasn't going to comment on what I wore to the opening ceremony, but whatever. <laughs> um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for this evening, um, a man who as soon as he opens his mouth needs no introduction, but until then I will tell you that it's Idea Stream's David C. Barnett. I consider him a friend and a mentor, and um, he's going to introduce the panel tonight. David C. Barnett. Thank you, Dan. Thank you everybody for braving today. Well, the gay game story was something I started covering back in 2009 with a phone call to Cologne, Germany, where of all things, Cleveland Akron beat out Boston and Washington, D.C. <laughs> and, and as the rest of the world adjusted to the fact that Northeast Ohio's got game, <laughs> came a series of stories from me, both here and on NPR, about a community pulling together to host a logistically challenging event, the consciousness raising opportunities that that week offered, and the personal stories that revealed the stakes for some of these athletes and how the games were truly life-changing. The people on our panel here represent the reason why the games came off so smoothly. There was some trepidation at first, what's gonna happen? No problems. I'm going to introduce each person, ask a few general questions, and then we're going to open, then we'll open it up to your questions, okay? So first of all, uh, we're going to talk about the lessons and the legacies of Gay Game 9. And uh, John Grafton, uh, to my left here, is board member of the Gay Community Endowment Fund of the Akron Community Foundation. And since Akron often gets second billing whenever there are Cleveland-Akron collaborations, we're going to start with him. Yay! <laughs> We heard about the Cleveland Foundation's new LGBT Legacy Fund, 
that was started recently, and the Akron has had a gay games, a gay and community endowment fund since the late 90s. So your fund has a bit of a track record. Can you give us a sense of what foundation support can mean and what you've been doing? Oh, David, it, it's amazing. Uh, you know, I'm getting up there now in age, but I'll tell you the things that have happened in my lifetime are unbelievable. And I look back at the Gay Community Endowment Fund, which was started by three or four friends of mine uh, in Akron, uh, as you say, late 90s, early 2000, we joined uh, Akron Community Foundation, which gave us the structure for investment and guidance in terms of grant making. And since that time, we've been able to uh, build our endowment fund up to the million dollar mark, which for us was a huge, huge task. But we're so proud that we've hit that finally. Uh, over the years, we've been able to give out a, over $360,000 in grants to benefit the local LGBT community and the community in general. They're not all grants to LGBT organizations. We've uh, benefited the uh, Akron Jewish Center, uh, the Battered Women's Shelter, uh, the Community AIDS Network. Uh, we just have a, a litany of wonderful uh, grantees that have been helping our community grow, become accepted, and prosper in Northeast Ohio. Phyllis Harris is executive director of a truly storied institution in um, the Cleveland area, the LGBT Community Center of Greater Cleveland, which was one of the lead community partners for the Ninth of Gay Games. And after all those years in a storefront in Detroit Shoreway, you're moving into your own building. We are. After 40 years of being uh, itinerant. <laughs> Leading up to the Gay Games, you were involved in the <coughs> consciousness raising efforts. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, training sessions for police and others. Are there some stories from those sessions? Either funny misconceptions <laughs> or heart touching stories? Uh, lots of stories. Um, lots of good collaboration coming into it. We knew that we. As the LGBT Community Center, we have some expertise around training and education, and as it relates to our mission around advocacy for the rights and respect of LGBT folks, we're, we're going to be talking about who we are and um, helping people to get ready. And so, you know, several organizations, the LGBT Community Center, um, the Diversity Center of Northeast Ohio, you know, got together, started thinking about Plexus LGBT Chamber of Commerce in terms of um, providing training and education for businesses, local like businesses and, and individuals. Um, we came together, you know, in advance of the Gay Games, um, developed our training. I got the opportunity to present um, to the city of Cleveland um, law enforcement professionals. You know, uh, you know, an easy, an easy yes, and a hard thing to do, but you know, we were able to do it, and so we delivered. Um, 40 trainings over 40 weeks every Monday at 8 o'clock. I was there at the academy um, walking into the room of 40 to 50 City of Cleveland law enforcement professionals in their uniforms, um, you know, moving inside as I walked down the hall about, you know, feeling like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was scary and it was, um, it was, um, it was life changing in a, in, a, in a way. I think it helped set the tone for much of the training that continued to happen throughout the year by all of the organizations and individuals involved. Um, you know, it was respectful. Um, we went in with basic information. This is, you know, this is not, uh, this is an event, um, some information, but it's gonna be a journey, you know, of learning and understanding. And saying that, you know, we really wanna be here to be able to help you to do your jobs, better, help your, um, your professionals and having an understanding of the community and what is about to happen in terms of the number of folks who are coming here with an expectation to experience, have a, a life-changing experience for many people. But were they, were they did you see people there going, <sighs> no, no. Or, or were, you know. Yeah, were, were. yeah. you know, it's kind of interesting. I, you know, it, it was very, it's a, it's a whole culture that I learned about. Just like, you know, we were teaching about, you know, LGBT Cleveland, um, Northeast Ohio, LGBT people and the culture. I also had to learn and learn over those 40 weeks, learned about their culture and around respect and, you know, around um, their, 
desire to do their jobs, and some of them just wanted to know the rules, you know, like, so, I, you know, I, yes, I need this information because, you know, I just need to do my job. But, I, but one of the, um, I don't know if it was unexpected, because after you talk to people about who you are, if you can get to them, um, typically, they, they're going to understand, you get to the humanity of it. So it wasn't necessarily unexpected, but it's a scary proposition to walk in to all of this power um, and talk about who you are. And then the after effect um, was really, has been, you know, during the trainings, they have to be respectful, so they listen. But afterwards, the questions, um, the comments that I would get um, in the community, the fact that they would show up at the center and just check in, you know. Um, they would check in, what would they, they just say um, hello? You know, one, you know, one significant moving um, engagement was, I was at Tower City for an event and a police officer walked up to me and said, you know, you were in our training, because of that I was able to talk to my sister about who she is. Wow. So things like that, that I, you know. Nice. Yay, yeah, like that. Then we have Thomas Noby, long-suffering executive director <laughs> no, no, of I'm the suffering. 2014 oh, Gay word. Games. <laughs> and as you, now, as you folks were ramping up for the games, there were some high-profile crimes against LGBT people, culminating in a very emotional community meeting. I don't think I'll ever forget at Pilgrim Church in Tremont. Right. Did that give you any trepidation about safety for the thousands of visitors who were coming or, or for their perceptions of safety here in Northeast Ohio? Well, first of all, and I got asked by a number of uh, folks uh, during that time from uh, here locally and, and around the country about what this would mean for the games. And my response was, you know, first of all, we're a big city like any other city. And unfortunately, we have events like this occur. But I was confident that the community would pull together in order to uh, make sure that our guests were, uh, would feel safe and welcome. And um, that's what happened. And, and then what, nothing happened, essentially. Correct. I remember maybe one guy with a sign, maybe. We, and believe me, we, we were prepared. And this goes back to the collaboration you were yeah. talking about with you know, folks like the Diversity Center around uh, training. But we had Homeland Security, we had the FBI, we had the, the, the police forces from Akron and Cleveland and, and the county, and everyone was really ready, just in case. And thank God, nothing occurred. It, it was just incredible the way the community came together and, and embraced its visitors. Finally, we have the Cheyenne retiring Michelle Tamalo. <laughs> The co-founder and president of Fit Technologies, one of our neighbors at the Idea Center at Playhouse Square, where that huge chandelier hangs outside our windows. Uh, Michelle is also board president of Plexus, the LGBT and allied chamber of commerce, and another lead community partner for Gay Games 9. So, so what is a lead community partner, what did that mean for Plexus? Well, um, quite a bit, actually. And, you know, Tom mentioned one of the firsts around the collaboration that happened with the security forces. I think that what that meant from a community partner standpoint, from a lead community partner standpoint, was another one of the many firsts that GG9 did across the 30-year history of the games, is that the way that we approached the organization, the structure of how we were going to go about the games. And you know, the, the thought of organizing the organization doesn't seem sexy or isn't exciting, but I really think that it was what was helpful to lead us to the success that we had was because one of the first things was that setting up this idea of lead community partners um, was then the outreach to small and medium-sized businesses and larger businesses and community partners that range from faith partners to neighborhood partners to um, other community organizations to arts partners across all of that. and. In that, it was not only doing outreach to them, but then saying to all of those organizations, which weren't LGBT um, organizations, was saying, here's how you can get involved. And that's, you can be a volunteer. And how do you organize your um, employees or your constituents around that? Um, here's how you can sponsor this event that we need to raise a considerable amount of money to do. And 
um, the board and other outreach committees, you know, came up with ways in which businesses can get involved for $500 and be engaged that way. Um, and that gave them entree to learning about training that was, was happening. Um, ways to find out how to be a vendor for the gay games, another first for um, 2014 gay games, is make a commitment to diversity in um, the supply chain and saying how do we um, buy local, how do we um, look at um, giving business to minority and LGBT owned businesses here locally. So, And I saw that the, this was the first time the gay games had ever had that complete chain of uh, total vendor buy-in. Definitely from that commitment, absolutely. And from our understanding, that entire structure of um, lead community partners and community partners and um, levels of small business and medium-sized businesses sponsors, all of that was um, you know, completely kind of original to the 30-year history of the games. So we're here tonight to talk about legacies and lessons. Let's start with some lessons. That, that, that presumes that not everything went totally smoothly. John, does something come to mind? Well, Tom, Tom mentioned, I'm sorry, did you say Tom or John? John. <laughs> Tom, Tom mentioned the safety forces and we have a member on our Akron task force uh, who's a lieutenant in the Akron Police Department, a, uh, uh, a gay woman who is just amazing, and, and she, on our board. she was that's on the board. right, and on the on the GG9 board, and executive committee, and executive committee, and she was, I think, behind the organization of all these police departments, uh, which was they. She told me it was the first time they had ever all gotten together. And these are the little towns, I mean, down in Akron, we got Cuyahoga Falls, Monroe Falls, you know, Summit County Sheriffs. I mean, it's just amazing. It's well over 100 different departments. And of course, the concern was, you know, would something bad happen? But on the other hand, they learned what was about to happen and made a commitment to really uh, uh, <coughs> Embrace the diversity and the guests, the the athletes, and all their visitors coming to Northeast Ohio, and I think they did a, an excellent job of that. And I would say this is going to be a, a a lesson that we all can learn. We need to concentrate on what makes us alike, not our differences. It's it's what what the similarities are between people and between peoples, and make it work. Uh, so I would say that's just something that really came out of it well. What about for you, Phyllis? You know, I, I think I, when I thought, thought about the lessons, it, it was more positive. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't um, claim to say that, you know, there weren't any glitches in, mm -hmm. in, in the, in the okay. model, um, but it has to do with the way that we begin to collaborate. Um, I have to give a, you know, acknowledgement to um, Christy Andresik. She came to the center to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. It's so good. That's right. So um, basically, to tell me about this model for lead community partner, and then you could do this, and you can do that, and, and if anybody knows me that much chatter toward me, I'm you know I'm getting every other word, and but I, I remember, <laughs> I remember I just trusted the process. I trusted the process. I really learned how to instead of saying pound go all out to say hashtag go all out <laughs> and I was serious about it and so we um, you know like, <laughs> she was like you know she was like this is how this is how you can get other people in this is this is the opportunity around um, um, you know really taking the groups that might be uh, you know, marginalized within the L, the D, the B, the T. So we are the, the, you know, this marginalized group of people. And then we have all the, these differences and the, this, this diversity within the L, the D, the B, the T around the organizations. And, and so this is a way to do it. And I would go, okay. And then I would just do the next level of what, you know, we were doing. And it got me connected to Jeff Kipp from Neighborhood um, progress and mm -hmm. he got me connected to like I knew a lot of the players I was new to the center I knew a lot of the players in terms of their organizations and a little bit about what they did but I began to see how we could work together 
And it's that question that you get from foundations all the time, or that, that directive, you know, <laughs> collaborate. to collaborate. But nobody tells you how to do it. And you know it's a good thing to do. And I, I call it, it was like the, the oldest trick in the book to really figure out a way to collaborate in a way that it was gonna be impactful, right? It, it, it didn't mean that we didn't have, like sometimes it was like this, you know. Um, but when folks came to us and said, you know, you forgot this group, we, instead of saying, no, we didn't, and getting defensive, we tried to figure out a way to, to be more inclusive. Um, so it was, it's a lesson that, you know, we had the, we had the tools, we had the information, we had the knowledge, um, and we had to apply it, right? We had to implement it. And then, we're not talking about legacies yet, though, right? No. <laughs> but, okay, so, but, yeah, so I think that was the biggest lesson, that we had what we needed, we had enough expertise, there was enough for, for everyone, and how do we, do this in a way that we can be most effective so that we could show up, and we did. A lesson for you, Tom. So my lesson <clears throat> is um, a little story about a young man named Andre, and it, it, it relates a little bit to what Ron Richard was talking about, the column that he read in the New York Times. Andre um, was um, a referee at one of our events uh, during the gay games. And uh, as a result of his participation, he received a, a couple medals for that, which he took home very proudly, put in his uh, bedroom, hung them on the wall. And one day he came home in December and he, they were gone. He looked out the window and they were in the trash out on his tree lawn. Um, obviously, he was devastated. He went to his mother and, and said, why, why are my medals in the garbage? And she launched into a, anti-gay tirade against this young man who's uh, probably 18. And he emotionally um, withdrew from his parents and uh, was having a very difficult time. I received an email in, in late December from a family friend, a priest, who recounted this story to me and asked me whether we had any extra medals because this young man had, um, you know, the medals were gone. So uh, Rob Smitherman, who is now in Chicago, most of you know Rob, um, colleague, um, instrumental in making these games such a success. He and I scheduled a time to meet with Andre and his friend the priest and another high school student that he was friends with, another gay high school student. And Andre then recounted once again um, what happened, tearfully recounted this, um, and of course it was even more wrenching to hear the story in person than it, than it was to read about it. So um, Rob and I brought a gold medal for the young man and a participation medal which we gave to him, which he tearfully accepted. And we talked more you know, about how things will get better as the, as the program um, talks about. Um, and I believe it will for him. I mean, he's going to be going to college next year and will be removed from a very um, kind of unhealthy environment. But the lesson is uh, we rightfully should celebrate all the hearts and minds that we changed um, through the gay games. But as Ron said that uh, Frank Bruno pointed, Bruni pointed out in his article, we have so much w more work to do. So while we need to celebrate, we also need to remember that there are folks out there who even went through this experience and still, you know, haven't been able to celebrate it in, in quite the same way that the rest of us have. Michelle? I mean, it's a perfect segue to the story that Tom told is that, and this is kind of a lesson and a legacy, I guess, is that we had all this grand success and there was all the celebration and the, literally it was palpable, the energy and the <clears throat> vibrancy and the love um, and all of that happened in the context of a state where we we don't have any protections mm -hmm. for the exact people that we're celebrating and so I think that that's part of the, the lesson and the legacy is the work that it is just the beginning we have obviously serious work that needs to be done here in our state to get protections for LGBT individuals and then also we had this grand celebration amidst um, even municipal ordinances and other legal protections in the, those municipalities that also aren't there. And so it's this wanting to use that motivation and this inspiration and that real celebration to continue that work, which at times feels unbelievably um, 
heavy, but knowing that we can you know, make those strides to move forward. And it's one of the things that when we talk about what can all of us here do as civic leaders and as constituents here in Ohio is mm -hmm. then look at what is happening in your own municipalities, what is happening within your own organizations around policy, around legal protections, and that's some of what will you know, again be talked about at the um, session next week about transgender and ordinances and all of those sort of things, but that's the real power of this. I want to get to audience questions, but let's why don't we quickly do one more round of talking about legacies. The fact that the gay games were here a week in August how is, what has that left us to go into the future? Well, a couple of things in Akron. Uh, FGG, the Federation of Gay Games, had suggested that an educational conference might be in order, mm -hmm. particularly for people coming from countries where gays are persecuted, or it's illegal, whatever it may be. So we decided to put on a, an educational conference, and we had a consortium of uh, PFLAG, uh, Community AIDS Network, the Gay Community Endowment Fund, the University of Akron, the Akron Jewish Center, and a one-day educational conference tied in with a street fest the following day in downtown Akron called Flare Fest. And these are going to go on again this year, and we hope for coming years. I mean, yeah. that's a legacy. It's it was so successful. <laughs> It was amazing. In downtown Akron, we procured flags from the countries where all the participants were <coughs> coming from and intermixed those with the rainbow flags and had them up lining Main Street in downtown Akron. Boy, that's something I never thought I would see <laughs> in my lifetime. So the, the real legacy, though, I think, is the embracing of the straight community to our visitors. I don't know of anybody who came here that didn't get a welcome and leave here with a sense of familiarity with the area and family with the area. I was just so proud of that in our area. What about for you, Phyllis? Um, you mentioned we have a, um, we're going to have a new building. Right. And so, you know, definitely very exciting. Your amazing energy sort short. Here. <laughs> Here we go. How are we doing now? Now? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, um, mentioned we, 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 we have a new, an, an opportunity for a new building and we'll be finding a new home for the center. Um, we're celebrating 40 years this year. Um, but part of uh, the legacy around this is I mentioned the, um, the relationships that were established through the process of being a lead community partner for the Gay Games. And, um, you know, we, the center had a volunteer driven, and talk about trusting the process, a volunteer driven um, event after event called Momentum, in which those who were still interested and in, um, excited about, you know, around the energy, around what was happening, um, you know, what post gay gay games came together and you know to touch base with each other to celebrate again to to, to move it forward um, as we are looking for it, it, you know it, it makes good sense to as we're looking for a new home for the center um, that we would get input and feedback from the community um, whether that's other LGBT organizations um, groups individuals you know neighborhoods, um, you know, to get information from them about what would be ideal in terms of a, a center location, um, you know, letting them know, being transparent what the parameters around our, you know, donation is from our anonymous donor, um, letting them know that we have support for, you know, the, the you know, sustaining the center in the future, um, the Milton Tamar Maltz Family Foundation, a $500,000 match, you know, all of, the, all of those relationships that have been established and are continue to be cultivated and nurtured, um, the collaboration that, that is happening is moving forward with us as mm -hmm. we move the center forward. So it's, it's pretty amazing, you know, like people listen if I call now and, you know, because, <laughs> you know, like um, they want to collaborate. They had a good experience, you know, 
<laughs> they want to they want to continue the experience. We talked about it recently about, you know, we all we have different niches around the training that we do and, you know, there's enough. You know, we're not done yet. And so it's a, it's a it's a great legacy. A lot of work. It's not going to be easy, yeah. but I feel like, you know, just like I, you know, initially, you know, I have my team, the board leadership and as the board, you know, builds and you get to know them and then I have my team and building our staff and our volunteers and and our donors, and now I have these team of other, you know, leaders, um, individuals in the community as we're moving forward. So I think that's pretty big. I'm not like really Pollyanna, not much. I'm pretty optimistic, and I understand the work that goes with it, but I think it's a significant legacy in terms of um, what it brings to the LGBT Center, what it will bring to Cleveland. You know, I'm a Clevelander. And I'm a lesbian, you know, <laughs> um, and I'm a mom, and all those things. But so I think the the legacy um, is still like very palpable for me. That's cool, Thomas. So I'm going to tell another story because I think stories can be powerful. Um, this story is about um, Irina, and Irina um, is from St. Petersburg, Russia, and she was here to participate in the Gay Games in August as of. Um, Badminton player, C correct? I was just going to make up a sport. <laughs> <coughs> there were 36 plus sports. I'm trying to remember which one. And Arena racked up quite a few gold medals um, playing racquetball at Case Western Reserve University. When she returned to St. Petersburg, uh, she planned on opening a studio for same-sex couples because she's also a dancer, a ballroom dancer, and she had plans to, to do that. Um, but in September, another woman, a lesbian who owned a dance studio in St. Petersburg, was murdered. And um, Irina and her partner, Natalia, uh, who had, Natalia was going to help Irina, uh, uh, Natalia being a businesswoman, going to help her open up um, a studio. Um, they started thinking, how s was it safe, you know, um, in general, let alone opening a same-sex um, studio. They took some self-protection courses and you know, monitored the situation. Finally, they came to the conclusion that they did not feel safe in St. Petersburg. So they decided um, they were going to seek safety out of the country. Where did they come? To the US. Where in the US? To Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> Why? Did they come to Cleveland, Ohio? Because of the experience that Irina had during her week here in August, uh, feeling that embrace of the community, n also in no small part to Rebecca and Nikki, her hosts, um, who took great care of her. So, um, Rebecca, or Natalie, or Natalia and Irina are about to initiate a process seeking asylum here in the U.S. It'll be in a few months. They're on a tourist visa right now. We're keeping it, you know, this is, these are young ladies, um, and we want, we want to support them, but we also want to be careful that this process is positive because um, Irina has told me that they will stay here in Cleveland if they get asylum and, and live here. So the legacy here, in my mind, is we talked about making sure that everyone, including ourselves, would um, know that Northeast Ohio was a place that embraced diversity and inclusion. And I think having these young women here in our midst and here tonight with their hosts at this table, really, really tells us that we are making inroads in that respect, that these ladies would want to come here of all places um, and, and get re-embraced, as it were, as they courageously um, approach um, a process that could take a number of years. So um, I just, that's a legacy that I'm very proud of. And um, again, thank you for being here tonight. that. How do you follow that? Exactly. You got a hard job now. I mean, I'm just, I think we're forever changed. This, everyone here, in addition to those 
300 or so sponsors and community organizations and 3,000 volunteers. We're forever changed and I think that it allows us as a community and not just an LGBT community but a much broader diverse community to say what's next. What's the next best big thing that we can do here in our region or in some other even bigger scale possibly. So I think that's a pretty amazing legacy. That's our panel. Uh, Daniel Malthrop's going to come back here and uh, talk to us a little bit and then we will open it up to you for your questions. Thank you, David. Tonight at the City Club of Cleveland, we are enjoying a panel discussion that we're calling 2014 Gay Games, Lessons and Legacies, featuring, as you all know, but I will say anyway, John Grafton, board member of the Gay Community Endowment Fund of the Akron Community Foundation, Phyllis Harris, executive director of the LGBT Community Center of Greater Cleveland, Thomas Noby, executive director of the 2014 Gay Games, and Michelle Tamalo, co-founder of Fit Technologies and president of the board of directors for Plexus. Our moderator is WCPN senior reporter and producer, David C. Barnett. Uh, we're about to head into our audience Q&A, and we encourage you all to formulate your questions for the panel now. And, uh, and I'll remind you, too, that our, we will bring microphones around to you, so all you have to do is just catch somebody's eye who's hand holding the microphone. We welcome guests at tables hosted by Bailey Edwards, the Cleveland Foundation, Gay Games 9, Key Bank, and the Plexus LGBT and Allied Chamber of Commerce. We thank you all so much for your support. Be sure to join us on Friday, March 6th at noon as we welcome Evan Wolfson, president and founder of Freedom to Marry, for a conversation on the historical, political, and social evolution of marriage equality in the United States. For more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Now we would like to return to our panel for the traditional City Club Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. You don't have to be a member to ask a great question. Holding the microphone today is our Associate Director of Development, Mike Cromaldi, and our Director of Programming, Stephanie Jansky. Do we have our first question? He holds it. So kind of following up, don't worry. <laughs> so following up <laughs> no, on Michelle, this is questions. finally my opportunity to ask. Um, oh boy. Following up, talking about all the non-traditional event sponsors, the corporate sponsors uh, to come in, and particularly the larger ones. I'm curious as to what you see the ramifications and the impact uh, at the corporate level, kind of that legacy there. Michelle, do you want to take that? I'll just yeah. throw out a few thoughts. Actually, it was, um, we had our Plexus annual meeting the other week, and I shared with that group that people here in this room and some other people um, talked with the Sherwin-Williams Company, who for the first time in its 148-year history actually s donated financial support to an LGBT event in 148 years. That was amazing, amazing. And what that did, which many of you um, can attest to lots of stories around this, is that it allowed other organizations to maybe think about things that they hadn't thought about before, about where, do they, where are their values, where do they, um, how are they spending their resources, how are they supporting their employees, how are they looking at their consumers and their clients and their customers. So I think it opens up a grand opportunity for people to look at, one, sporting events, um, but non-traditional events as well to say, how do we support those events and initiatives that support our values in a very different way than um, some other organizations allowed, have allowed, the, other events have allowed them to in their history. Anyone else want to chime in or anyone else? No, I think you covered it. Hello. Um, I, I was love wondering. I uh, know all these question hi. askers. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. Well, I, I, maybe it's not easy. Um, my question is: the legacy is measured a lot of times. You quantify things, but a lot of the um, things that I hear that are really touching are the stories that we, that you're sharing today. I, I wonder if and if there's can be tasks that we can do some sort of like listening project or video archive or something where each person who's been touched by the games can share their own story as a way of like capturing the legacy of the games. I think that's a that's terrific a idea. idea and we mm -hmm. ought to be, as we're constantly reminded and we should be that we can't, 
we need to keep this going. We need to capture a lot of what transpired uh, during the games before in the planning and after, but I think that's a great idea. That also uh, brings in mind the fact, you know, we do have tangible results and the final report of the gay games, for those of you who are into the numbers, um, we have for you to take home with you and it's also going to be posted on the GG9 website, which is going to at least be up while we don't have staff anymore. It's up there with, with that um, to be downloaded. Uh, so, but, I, so I wanted to make that point, but I think that's a great idea and we ought to look into to telling our stories. Didn't we start some of that at Momentum? Yes, we <laughs> say more. I, I was just gonna interject is that oh, yeah. the, um, Phyllis uh, um, shared a little bit about the event that was held in November, the Momentum event, and we actually started that process as we um, went into that event where there was um, a chance to sit in front of the videographer and tell some of those stories and to tell some about your experience. So again, it's just scratching the surface because again, any and all of you could be up here and have David interview all of us for five to 10 hours about the excitement that was um, the 2014 Gay Games. Hi, my name is Peter Schofield. Uh, with respect to the last person who spoke StoryCorps on public radio is a wonderful opportunity Ooh. to record yep. a lot of the stuff that's happened during the gay games. Um, <clears throat> as we think about uh, blowing this out throughout the state of Ohio, Equality Ohio is a wonderful organization that we should all get behind as much as we possibly can. The very first fundraiser for Equality Ohio took place on my back patio up in Cleveland Heights many years ago. I think there were about six or eight of us there. And the organization has grown and grown and become more and more uh, effective, I do believe. And the more we can do to get Equality Ohio to work with all of the organizations in the state, the better off we'll be, I do believe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Peggy Zone Fisher. I'm president and CEO of the Diversity Center of Northeast Ohio. And I love all these ideas. I think um, when we start gathering information about the legacy, that it should go all the way back to the role that the state of Ohio played and the role that the city of Cleveland played as far as stepping up with dollars to really fund, to really begin it and to fund it. Uh, and then, of course, with the help of the Cleveland Foundation and the Akron Community Foundation, we live in an amazing, amazing community. We have um, whoever, so my question is, who's going to compile all this? Because the Diversity Center spent two years, and unfortunately, Kristen DuVernay is not here today, our program director, but we spent two years developing the curriculum, writing the training, doing the doing really doing the work and part of it when we did this training <clears throat> which we're continuing to do we talk about the sustainability piece of it we actually go in we've gone into companies and we've looked at their policies and manuals and made sure that if you train a group of employees they may not be there in six months or a year but what are the protections for those new employees coming in. So we did a lot of that work with many, many companies. We have a lot of the metrics. We have a lot of that information. We train lots of small businesses and first responders and healthcare professionals. And so we'd love to share that information. So who is really gathering that? I guess is my question. It's important information to have. Well, yeah, that's a hundred thousand dollar question. Um, we, as the, the Gay Games, which um, the staff is no longer uh, with the Gay Games, we our board is still functioning for a brief time. We have turned over all of our information to the Western Reserve Historical Society, uh, which uh, will make available, um, um, you know, online they're, they're the, the things that would be online for anyone to access and also some of our other, like our signage and all that kind of thing is there as well. Um, so that was a start. 
But that is the $100,000 question is who, who is now going to take up the, the, the banner as it were and um, this is a big job. We've, believe me, we've talked about it. There's so much out there in terms of um, pulling it all together, this repository. So if anyone has yes. ideas. Yes. We yes. We, and yes. So I have a two-part question. Oh, two-part question. In the history of the gay games, have any gay games uh, ended in the black? And the second part of the question is, how did GG9 do? <laughs> Bill, you're jumping, what you're, you're stealing right. my thunder. These plants are <laughs> unbelievable, people. <laughs> Dan, did you do this? Where is Dan? It's the first time I've been called straight man. <laughs> so, Bill, I can answer um, part of that question, and the, and the uh, second part um, I'm about to, to um, announce. But there have been nine gay games. Um, the first two in San Francisco, some of you um, may have been there. I'm aware of some of you were. Uh, finished in the black marginally, $1,000 or so. Uh, the Chicago games, which were gay games um, 06. in 06, but Six they were gay games 7, took them um, a year to recoup um, a six-figure deficit. All of the, and, and uh, Cologne was, had a deficit that they never uh, recouped of a couple hundred thousand dollars. The other four were millions of dollars in the black. I mean in the red, right. in the red. So um, we are absolutely by far um, the most profitable uh, gay game. Hey. Yeah. So wait for it and I will, uh, and, I will be. Announcing. And Tom, are you going to tell us what you're going to do with all that profit? Yes. So uh, should I do that now? I guess. Any more, have any question. any more questions? Any more questions? And then I will. Any more yes. Carrie, do you have a question? <laughs> Carrie. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so weird to be on this side. So um, <laughs> it, thank you, first of all, for an amazing event. It was, I, I definitely felt like I was in a warm embrace for a year or a week. And hopefully well, that will continue Check on yourself. for a year. Um, but I guess that's really my question, is that now as we move forward, we do thank you for mentioning Equality Ohio. Thank you for all of you and the work that you're doing. How do we get all the people that we saw, the families who were new to this movement, who all the people who were new to the movement, how do we get education um, conferences here in Cleveland? How do we keep it going? How do we get the change that we need in our state um, with all the, the momentum that we have? So. Here's a simple question. <laughs> oh, that's super simple. No, I, 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 think it, I, don't. I think it goes back to um, continuing the, those relationships. I, I can tell you that after um, this experience, there's at least been at least been two other like world conferences um, that are going to take place like in 2018 and like a little ways off that have contacted. Um, is it Live Cleveland, Cleveland? Whatever, positively Cleveland. Positively. Destination. Cleveland. I'm sorry, destination, oh, destination. Cleveland. Um, Hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, you know they've contacted they've contacted us and, and said you know you know this is what we're doing. Do we have your support? You know how do we get the information out? Who 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 should we be talking to? And so I think that's happening. Um, Peggy mentioned ongoing training. Um, we. We have it, we, you know. We have uh, we get we we have more than we can handle right now. Honestly, we have that many requests in terms of training, um, you know, corporations, um, city of Cleveland schools, um, you know, safe zone training for their school nurses and administrators, and so uh, we're doing it. I think um, we're, we're trying to keep up. We need partners. We need to collaborate. Um, that's the part. That's the that's the the lens that I have around it. Um, um, be, being the hub, if you will. I have this this vision of the the center in the center, and all of these organizations that bring their expertise um, and knowledge. You know, there's some there's some reciprocity. The arrows are going both ways. You know, they can touch base. We have some resources. We have some expertise. They have some. They bring it to the center. We take what we have and we share it out into the community. So that's our part right now, shoring up the center, right? Making sure there's great leadership and, and that we have a, a location that is gonna be useful to the city of Cleveland. Um, so it's, it's, you know, back to the grind, is doing the work, um, celebrating the successes, taking the, this time 
asking tough questions, challenging the leadership, and building new leaders. I don't, you know, that is the, I hate to make it seem like it's that easy um, because all of that takes work and being intentional about the work and the, the connections and not forgetting that it, you know, it took how many ever years of work for it to, to be this success. Why would we just stop it now, you know, so. That was Phyllis Harris, who's executive director of the LGBT Community Center of Greater Cleveland. Uh, to my left is John Grafton, who's uh, from the Gay Community Endowment Fund of the Akron Community Foundation. Michelle Tamalo on the end there is board president of Plexus, the LGBT and Allied Chamber of Commerce. And Thomas Noby, executive director for all this time of the 2014 Gay Games, and he has a very special announcement to make. I do indeed, and I've worn a green tie tonight. Um, <laughs> so, you know, from the outset of planning the games, our board and our staff uh, were really determined to see that these games finished in the black. Looking back at the history of the games, we felt we really um, wanted to make that commitment that we would do things right and, and, and finish with something that we could give to the community. And we want to do that with some, some sort of legacy. So we incorporated this intention into our agreement with the Cleveland Foundation, which we know really um, stepped out of the box and became the first presenting sponsor of any gay games in the history of the games. We <laughs> so what we did was we pledged that whatever we had left over after we paid all of our bills, we would uh, donate 80% of whatever we had left over to the, um, to the Cleveland Foundation to a new Gay Games LGBT Legacy Fund, which we have talked about tonight. Our board then voted to give the remaining 20% to the uh, Gay Community Endowment Fund of the Akron Community Foundation in recognition of its long-standing support of Akron's LGBT community. So we were thrilled to be able to do that. So as it turns out, and I, I mentioned this uh, in response to your question, we are um, the most profitable uh, gay games in the history of, of the gay games movement by far. And I'm delighted to announce that Gay Games 9 will be donating $150,000 to uh, these two foundations. <laughs> which again, I can't repeat it enough, have both been longstanding supporters, proactive supporters of the LGBT community in Northeast Ohio. So Ron and John, do you wanna come up here? Um, we are grateful to be able to entrust these dollars to two uh, organizations, um, such respected organizations, who are going to help ensure that we have um, a legacy that will continue to support the LGBT community in the region. And I am going to um, give them, because just so you know, they have, we've given them the dollars, we didn't want it in our grubby hands, uh, so we, um, <laughs> they're fine, they're and fine. All, they, they, yeah. they, all the money went to the foundation, they wouldn't even get those big old checks. That's right. So I am uh, giving each of the gentlemen a Gay Games uh, 9 medal. Yeah, and then I got to talk about something else. Ron would like to say something, and then I'm going to ask Joe Simperman, who I saw texting back there. Are you there? Yeah, still texting. Tweeting, I'm sorry, uh, to come up here. I think he's brought something with him from City Hall. But Ron, do you want to? I just wanted to quickly say thank you so much for the funds, and you have my word of honor that every dime will be spent in the most effective way to move us forward for LGBT rights. Thank you. Ron, would you please just come back here? Um, and I want to ask John to come up here too. Uh, we actually have a, a resolution, uh, and uh, as often happens uh, in the craziness of City Hall, 
uh, I brought one and there's two, uh, which beats the time that I actually brought a congratulatory uh, resolution and instead grabbed the condolence scroll. So uh, we're going to share this, but I want to share a quick story. Um, when uh, I had the chance to sit down with Ron and uh, talk to him uh, initially about one of some of the things that were happening legislatively in the city of Cleveland, uh, he put his hand on my hand and he said, Joe, you don't have to sell me. You forget that the Cleveland Foundation was the first foundation in the country to proactively stand for people who were struggling with AIDS. And I like nonprofits that have an opinion. I like it when we get political because human rights, unfortunately, today are very political. And I look at these two men, John and Ron, and I think to myself, I thank God every single day that they come down on the side of right. There's a lot of things we could say about John and Ron. For Ron, I know you well. You're an amazing dad. You're a loving husband. People who are friends with you say you're a pretty great guy. You also happen to run a pretty awesome foundation. But Ron, I think there's a lot of things you've done in your life that you could say you're proud of. For me as a council person, as a Clevelander my whole life, this is something that we're proud of you. And we love you. And we love you. Yours is coming. I have yours. Thank you. Please don't tell Mayor Plisquelic I forgot this. <laughs> I already texted him. <laughs> the City Club Forum is now adjourned. <laughs>